The London Midland and Scottish Railway 6399 Fury. Now, from the get-go, let's be fair to this thing. That is an incredibly awesome name for a train. Like, this engine has a phenomenal naming scheme right here. Look at it. It's the Fury. Oh, yeah. And you may see this and say, well, what's wrong with that? It looks pretty normal. And yeah, outwardly it does. But the Fury was a unique experiment in steam technology. The idea of the Fury was to save fuel by utilizing high pressure steam compared to the usual steam engines using low pressure steam. High pressure steam is thermodynamically more efficient, so it could have saved on fuel costs if they got it to work correctly. And for further context, a normal steam train, low pressure steam, would operate between 200 to 250 psi pounds per square inch. High pressure locomotives, however, would operate at at least 350 psi, sometimes far exceeding that. But again, the idea was to save fuel. Higher pressure meant they could get more out of the steam. Thermodynamically, it's it's all a bunch of physics and nonsense and things like that. I don't need to bore you with the details. But the point was, the Fury was meant to be a cost-saving measure and could have paved the way for future designs utilizing high-pressure steam in a way that saved the railway's money. Did it do that, though? Well, no. Not not even a little bit. Uh, it, it, just, it just didn't. The thing about high-pressure steam is that the train has to be designed around the idea that there's going to be more pressure inside of it. And the Fury didn't completely take this into account, to the point that it successfully managed to kill somebody. Yes, in fact, this is the first time on these top five lists where I am talking about a train that, through its own ineptitude, did manage to kill a person. In its testing phase, it was used to pull passengers, as it was meant to do from the get-go. And it was approaching the station at low speed, one of its high-pressure tubes just decided to burst, and the escaping steam ejected the coal fire through the door, which killed Mr. Lewis Schofield of the Superheater Company. Uh, so, yeah, that was really, really, really bad, but weirdly enough, um, that accident had nothing to do with why the Fury failed. Ultimately, it was down to they just couldn't get it to run. Like, it was towed often because it frequently suffered failures. Therefore, uh, it, it was defeating its own purpose. It was meant to save money, and it never earned any money for the railway. It was always a money pit. So, development was ceased, and it was scrapped. Could it have been better? Probably. I think given time, maybe with modern technology, you might be able to get high-pressure steam to work, and then you have safety in mind. I mean, you know, it's bad enough when a regular steam train explodes or something, but, you know, with high-pressure steam, ooh, I mean, that could be really bad. So, uh, maybe it's for the best anyway. The British Rail Class 21. You know, no, I'm not even gonna get mad about it anymore. I, 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 I've given up on you. I really have, British Rail. It has been every single list you appear at least once, if not twice, and I am just, I've, I've accepted it. I, I don't even know what I expect anymore. Um, it's just, it's just one of those things. So it's fine, fine, fine. We're just gonna keep you around. You know, it's, it's, it's a tradition now. There must always be a British Rail type, probably a diesel, on these lists because you guys failed repeatedly at your one job for a really long time. Well, I don't want to stress, not forever. British Rail did get their act together eventually, but not before they created the Class 21. Now, the Class 21 is another diesel electric locomotive by British Rail, and it was all part of their modernization plan, and da 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 da. If you watched the previous episodes, you probably know where this is going, because literally every time they ordered a diesel so far underneath this modernization plan, with a few exceptions, it's always de been delivered with serious issues. And boy, howdy, good Christmas. Class 21 sure had plenty of those. You want me to list them? You want to have fun with this? Okay, fine. Uh, well, the engines sucked. Let's just start there. They were just bad. Uh, because of course they were. But, but, more, more, more involved. Uh, th th their cooling systems, uh, weren't good enough, so they had frequent overheat, so that was good. 
Um, there was leaking in the engines, um, because they weren't constructed to the appropriate tolerances, so that was good. Uh, the cylinder heads often fractured. Uh, lubricating oil escaped into the battery compartment. Oh, and there's also the minor case that uh, engine fires uh, were actually common in this type. Um, so that was um, that was alarmingly bad, uh, horrifying, frankly. Uh, it was just just one of those things. To its credit, the reason Class 21 is a little lower on the list is because it was rebuilt into Class 29. The 29s were a lot better. Well, they didn't serve very long because by the time they were rebuilt, British Rail didn't have much of a purpose for their particular design usage. They weren't economical at that point. But the point is that Class 21 did eventually evolve into something that was halfway decent, so you gotta give it that. The Boston and Maine T1 locomotive. Not to be confused with the Pennsylvania Railroad's T1. Some people have suggested that one for my list, and uh, that's like my favorite steam engine ever and I don't think it was ever given a fair chance to shine, so I'm really reluctant to include it on worst ever lists when it appeared during the tail end of Steam, and we don't really know how good it could have been if given the appropriate amount of love and attention, which it just didn't get. The Boston and Maine T1, on the other hand, uh, we, I, can't, I can't defend that way. There's, it's not going to happen. Why? Well... Okay, you probably look at this and say, that looks like a pretty decent steam engine. I don't know what's going on with the front of it, where it looks like it's like a nun hood or something. I don't know, it's just an interesting way to design it. But other than that, I mean, it looks fine. What's the, what's, what's the problem? Oh, I'll tell you what the frickin' problem is. It was their four-wheeled trailing truck. These were two eight fours, just for clarification. The trailing truck was designed in a really, um... Well, bad way. Let's just, let's just say it. It's not even dance around the issue. When the truck moved along the track, it actually made contact with the engine's firebox, which meant that the firebox took damage. Repeatedly. A lot. And this awkward motion of, you know, it touching the firebox at all, meant that the locomotive suffered with track adhesion as well as just, you know, derailments. Uh, it, 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 they, they had derailments often enough to be annoying. Um, you know, namely more than zero, is really what I'm trying to say. They, um, they, they, they just weren't good. The Boston and Maine Railroad hated them so much that they literally couldn't wait to get rid of them. They sold a few off, a few to Southern Pacific and to Santa Fe. Santa Fe, in particular, rebuilt them as the 4193 class. And the rest were scrapped, and none were preserved, because, no, but you, I don't, it, it, the, 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 the real, the rear truck was hitting the firebox, I, I, I don't even understand how that was overlooked, like, you'd think that'd be the first thing you notice, wow, part of the train is touching another part of the train, repeatedly, um, that's probably bad, maybe we should fix it, no, 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 better not, I'm sure it'll be fine, it can't possibly cause the train to fly off the rails at any given moment, no problem at all. The General Motors Aero Train. Okay, um, <laughs> I should probably, <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I can't even look at it sometimes, um, I should probably give this thing a bit of context, because, um, that's, um, that, well, that, 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 let's talk about the elephant in the room here. Boy, howdy, is that a weird-looking train. And, yeah, but at the time, it was sort of meant to be distinctive. The idea of the aero train was to push into the future for rail travel. And it was introduced in 1955, when people's ideas of, like, the future, namely now, um, were not accurate. That's, that's, that's be honest, that the people's envisions of the future were, were, were relatively skewed in, in some ways, not all, but, but in some ways, so, but it was meant to look sleek, futuristic, next generation, you know, it, it, it was meant to look distinctive. The air train was also designed to help railways who were suddenly struggling with the advent of cars being significantly more popular, as well as air travel becoming affordable. So, it was meant to capture the public's imagination, try to get ticket sales up, and also be a good, you know, engine on its own. Was it? Well, no, of course not. It wouldn't be on this list if it was. It was terrible. But it has the weirdest problem I think I've ever seen on a train thus far. Like, this is so bizarre to me, I don't even know where... It, it's simple, but it, when I say it, you're probably gonna be like, how? So, let me explain this. 
The arrow train was made mostly out of aluminum, and in fact was designed to be as light as possible. Part of this was to make it easier for them to produce more uh, materials, you know, would be light and easy to assemble, things like that, so they could be manufactured, mass-produced on a cheaper level. But in addition, it was designed for high speeds, so the light of the train is, you know, the, the easier it is to get up to speed. Okay, that makes sense. Um, the problem here is that somehow, and I still don't even believe this, the aero train was underpowered. No, seriously, it struggled upgrades, it struggled when the train was too heavy, it struggled under weight that was considered light by normal train standards. So I can only imagine how bad it would have been if it had weighed as much as a normal train. Now, in fairness, it was capable of getting up to high speeds on level terrain with a train that wasn't fully loaded. But really, you're failing at, you know, your one job is what I'm trying to say. Like, you can't even, you know, pull a train. Like, the whole point of a locomotive is to pull the train. I think what makes it even worse is that, you know, when I say it was light, I'm including the cars in that because the aero train was sold as a set. The cars and the engine were meant to make up one solid unit. So the aero train was designed to pull the cars that it was included with, which were too heavy for it even though they were lighter than normal car- Do you see how stupid this is? The air train was sent out to a few different railways, Pennsylvania, Union Pacific, to name a few, who did run it a little bit, but problems with its ability to pull anything basically meant that it never stuck around for very long. The railways were unimpressed with it at best, and the whole thing was considered a pretty massive failure. Its radical design also didn't really catch on with people. Like, yeah, it was probably futuristic for the time, but at the end of the day, people just want to ride a train that gets them to point A to point B in a really fast manner, and, like, the aero train may look cool to some, but it uh, doesn't do its one job, so I don't see the point at, you know, at that level. Believe it or not, the aero train did survive into preservation in many forms. Number two and number three are actually on display at the National Railroad Museum in Green Bay, Wisconsin, and the Museum of Pre Transportation in Kirkwood, Missouri, respectively. In addition, several uh, theme parks and zoos have actually utilized its bizarre design on a smaller scale. Disneyland actually operated a small-scale version of the aero train for about two years back in the 50s, and the Washington Park and Zoo Railway in Portland, Oregon actually operates a small version of it to this day. On top of that, Ottawa Park in Rito, Nevada also operates a small version of the train. So I guess in a weird way, its odd design at least made it successful at capturing some people's imagination. Maybe it doesn't have a place outside of a theme park or a zoo, but hey, I mean, I guess that's a win. It still exists, you can see it. I mean, it's... It, it, look, it was really bad. It, it just was. Uh, it's a shame, but it, it was. That's why it's here. Let's just, let's just move on. London and Northeastern Railway Thompson Class L1. Finally, I can talk about Edward Thompson. Oh, goodness. I could easily make an entire video on this guy. But since this isn't an entire video on him, I'll give you the abridged version. Edward Thompson is a little infamous among rail fans. He was the chief mechanical engineer of the London and Northeastern Railway between 1941 and 1946, and he designed quite a number of steam trains during his tenure, and... well, okay. In fairness, some of them turned out alright. Not everything he did was terrible, but a lot of it was. He had a bit of a bizarre design ethos, and he also really seemed to hate the designs of one Nigel Greasley. Nigel Greasley, by the way, is one of the greatest mechanical engineers when it comes to trains in British history. So, you know, Thompson was really going after a guy that earned a lot of people's respect. And he didn't really, uh, really uh, compete with Greasley's level of skill and uh, finesse when it came to trains. Now, I was hard pressed to find, like, a truly awful train among Thompson. Now, there were plenty that had issues, but a lot of them were either resolved or weren't as bad as a lot of the trains I've talked about thus far. Except one. The Class L1 was a tank engine. A 264T, specifically. And it's a weird one for me to even talk about because, technically, it's actually not that bad of a design. As a freight engine, pulling low-speed trains that are very heavy, the L1 was exceptional. Its torque and tractive effort were exceedingly good for an engine of its type. 
But the problem is that it actually wasn't designed for that at all. The L1 was actually designed for passenger trains. And they were used for passenger trains. And this is where the problems became quite apparent. Not only were their 5 foot 2 inch wheels too small for fast outer suburban services, but um, because of their power output, again, that was very good at low speeds, the second they got up to high speed, they proceeded to shake themselves apart. Their axle boxes wore, their water tanks split open, and their oil pipes broke off! Literally, I've never heard of a train that's main problem was that it would literally shake itself to pieces. But that's exactly what the L1 consistently did. Maintenance was a freaking nightmare on these things because every time they came back from a run, something was broken. Something. How much? Who knows? It could be a lot of things. It could be anything on these. They were little balls of chaos. Every day was something new that was broken and they never really got any better. Believe it or not though, they lasted a pretty decent amount of time. They were built in 1945 and were withdrawn in 1962, towards the end of steam, and by that point they were under British rail. Which, of course, I don't know what I expected. To be fair, towards the end of their life, somebody realized that they could pull freight really, really well and do absolutely nothing but that. So they were reassigned under freight train duties, and that made them a lot better. So, like I said, the L1's a weird case where they were terrible for what they were made for, but they did find a niche somewhere, and served pretty well until the end of their life. Also, none were preserved, in case you were wondering. Maybe I'll make a video about Edward Thompson going over everything he did. He was an interesting guy, and, and I do think he's a little over-hated, knowing what I know about him, but to a certain extent, I get it. Many of his design ethos just didn't work, and the L1 just happens to be one of them. Till next time, this is Darkness, and I bid you all a fond farewell.